The Weekly Harvest, an in-depth look at the Brandon Weekings and the WHL. Washman trying to come up with it for Allison. Here's Allison right in front. He scores! Brandon Junior Hockey fans, you've waited two decades for this. In the league's 50th anniversary, your Wheat Kings are the champions. Hey again, welcome to another edition of the Weekly Harvest. It's episode 41, as always, presented by Coors Light, the official beer of the Brandon Wheat Kings. Please drink responsibly. My name is Chris Falco, Director of Game Day Ops of the Brandon Wheat Kings. He's Brandon Crow, voice of the Wheat Kings. Crow, how are you, bud? I'm good. You know, uh, I, I, we've talked before in the last couple of weeks. I've been I've been working outside doing the the service rig job, and luckily, Tundra Oil and Gas, the company that I've been working for, has shut down due to weather. Uh, so we didn't work Saturday, we didn't work Sunday, we didn't work today, and we're not working tomorrow. And uh, when you got guys working outside with cold metal pipe and uh, 10, 12 hours, that's just an injury waiting to happen. So um, been sitting at home, just catching up on a lot of reading and uh, watching some hockey. And I got the Ranger Islander game on behind me in the other room. You got the Ottawa game going on. And I was going to show you this. I showed you this before. You and I grew up Ottawa fans. And, you know, if you hang on to something long enough, it comes back into style. Because I got this old school Ottawa toque from when I was a kid. And it was like back in the 90s. And I found it in my bin of stuff. And now the logo is back to that same logo. And it's uh, <laughs> we're back to the cool logo again. So, hey, if you hang on to things long enough, they eventually come back into style. Uh, absolutely. I have a number. You know what? I, I was a Sense fan for, for a long time. I say was just, I don't know. <laughs> things kind of change. Uh, but... Uh, I have a lot of that Sens 2D logo laying around here. I uh, absolutely love that for people who didn't see Crow held up the old school toque. Um, if you just heard the dog, so I'm a little distracted. If you just heard the dog barking in the background, that's actually almost a mini theme is distraction here tonight. Uh, as we have had numerous internet issues, we have had dogs barking, we have had fire alarms, uh, we have had... Everything this week happened in the background around us and to the technology, but we have uh, still somehow st stuck it through here, Crow. You know, living in the country, you, you don't have the greatest internet. Uh, so I live just, just north of Verdon. You can see my house from Highway 1, but I don't have like the fiber cabled internet. I've, I've got RF now internet which is unfortunate. It's the only thing you can get out here. So it's been a radio signal and it's windy out right now and cold weather. I'm trying to stream a hockey game and do the podcast. It just didn't work. So I had to run to the other room and hit pause on the NHL game center because <laughs> it's taking up too much data. I'm sure my wife's probably working out in the other room with her phone going too. So yeah, we've had a <laughs> couple of technical difficulties, uh, but Hey, that's what makes this fun. So uh, we'll keep, uh, keep plugging away and, and trying to get her done. Yeah. Uh, later on in the pod, we're going to be talking about the email inbox and uh, some some other questions that were coming on in about some future stuff coming up, some more some more prize winners. Before we get into the interview with Ron Hextall, which I know a lot of people are very excited for this week, news and notes, Crow, some very important stuff came down and leave it uh, to the league to announce it after supper time on Friday night. But you know what? It literally, I, I guess, you know, of course, as soon as it was announced, they worked on the release and, and they got it out there. But Big information coming out of the U.S. Yeah, the uh, five teams in the U.S. division have been given the green light. Um, they are planning on starting the season Friday, March 19th. The state of Washington, which houses four of those five teams, uh, they have kind of eased restrictions a little bit. There'll be no fans allowed in the buildings, but they will be allowed to play and travel within the borders of Washington State. The Portland Winterhawks, who play out of Oregon, uh, they're going to move into the state of uh, Washington and just play all road games for the time being. They're going to practice at a Kent, Washington, which is where Seattle uh, calls home. So uh, they're planning to get going on March 19th. And um, government and state officials in Washington say they will um, come out with their own set of guidelines uh, in regards to protocol and safety. So uh, the WHL, they're doing their own thing, but uh, the state of Washington is going to do uh, a little bit of extra uh, safety precautions on top of that. So um, I know today I saw some social media from Red Deer, uh, some of the uh, players starting to arrive at the Alberta teams uh, as they get set to get going here right away as well. Uh, unfortunately, we heard the BC news uh, a couple of days ago as well. Dr. Bonnie Henry in BC pushing their start date back till at least the end of March. Uh, and there's still plenty of questions uh, surrounding Manitoba, Saskatchewan. We've heard 
Uh, a bubble based out of Regina was originally reported by Jeff America Sportsnet. And then, of course, that was uh, rebutted by Alan Miller, the uh, GM of the Moose Jaw Warriors. But John Paddock, the Regina Pats, going on record in free press in Winnipeg saying it is happening. And nobody really knows what's going on. So I would imagine that with with the rule of a 28-day work back, so that's what the league has kind of put in. So if they say we're going to start on March 10th, you have to go back 28 days to start the quarantining, testing, training camp period. So for every day that we wait is another day later the season can start. So I would expect there to be an announcement one way or another with what's happening with the Brandon Weekings, Winnipeg Ice, and Saskatchewan teams hopefully by the end of this week. Uh, congratulations to Braden Schneider, who played his first professional game for the Hartford Wolfpack on the weekend. Uh, two shots. He was plus two. Had a couple of uh, block shots as well. Uh, congrats to him. Logan Thompson, uh, he picked up the win for Henderson uh, in his first American League start. Uh, Reed Duke had an assist that night. And actually, Reed Duke just scored a couple of minutes ago for the Silver Knights as we record this. So a couple of former Wheat Kings doing good things in the American Hockey League. Uh, of course, Kale Clegg's been logging some big minutes with the LA Kings. Braden Shen's been one of the best scorers so far. We've talked about Provorov. We've talked about Patrick, uh, Ryan Reeves. We've talked about all these guys. But uh, congrats to, to Braden Schneider and getting in that first pro game. I got my New York Ranger hat on for him. And uh, I was talking to his dad last week, and he's really loving it down in Hartford. But uh, wants to get back and play for the Wheat Kings. But if he can't, he's in a pretty good spot out there on the East Coast. So congrats to him. We wanted to have some fun, and we reached out to someone that – I know a lot of people wanted to hear for, for, for quite a while. Uh, we were able to to contact him, and he was so gracious with his time. Not just a Wheat King legend, NHL legend, Ron Hextall, man. we we got to talk to huh. Ron Hextall. It was, was awesome. I was so pumped. Uh, it was so cool because I, I reached out on, on, on Twitter and because I'd had his contact info from when he was with Philly because I had done a couple of things for features for CKLQ and whatever. So I, I reached out to to his niece Leah Hextall, who I've had a relationship with uh, before, you know, broadcasting that sort of thing. So I sent her a note saying, "Hey, uh, what's Ron's updated uh, information?" And she said, "Well, here I'll send you the stuff. He uh, he should get back to you, no problem." Well, I sent an email to him, and he responded within like eight minutes. Yep, sure, no problem, love to. <laughs> and I was like, "This is fantastic." So. Uh, he was great. He jumped on, told some great stories. Uh, we did, like we said, we had a couple technical difficulties where my smoke alarm went off. My wife was cooking some Super Bowl snacks. Your dog was barking. We lost him on the internet for a little bit. But nonetheless, the legend of Philadelphia Flyer fame and, of course, a Brandon Wheat King from his junior days, Ron Hextall, this week's guest on episode 41 of the Weekly Harvest, brought to you by Coors Light. Our guest this week needs no real introduction. He's got a long resume that goes uh, a long ways back to his time in Brandon, and we are uh, more than excited to, to welcome Ron Hextall to the show this week. The Weekly Harvest is presented, as always, by Coors Light, the official beer of the Brandon Wheat Kings. Ron, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and uh, we were just joking that we don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, do you have plans for the rest of the night, You know, a little Super Bowl party or some appetizers, or are you fully a, a hockey guy? I, I'm pretty much fully a hockey guy. I'll probably, I'll probably watch some of it, but I got some things I got to do, so I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye on it. Ron, we know you know how how busy you are during the NHL season. Uh, normally, is that still kind of the case this year? Uh, whereabouts are you? Are you at home or are you with the team? No, no, I'm uh, I'm an I'm an advisor now, so it's not it's not full time. I watch all of the uh, Kings games. Yeah. Uh, on TV, whether it's uh, late at night or in the morning, um, I go to the. I'm, I'm actually spending part of the winter here in Florida, so I've been going to the Florida Panther games. And typically, with, you know, non-COVID, I would be going out to LA every, you know, five weeks or so for a week. Um, and that's pretty much the the scope of it. So you watch hockey every night. You keep an eye on the league, and that's what I do. Talk to the guys in LA there on a on a uh, fairly consistent basis, and watch their team and just try and give any advice that I, that I can. So is it a pretty broad job description then? Cause you know, senior advisor, it, it leaves a lot to the uh, imagination. So kind of what is your, what do your reports say? Is it about the on ice stuff? Is it, you know, is it scouting? Is it current guys, junior guys, or, or what does it all encompass? It's more, it's more just trying to help Rob Blake and, and Jeff Solomon, Nelson Emerson, their scouting staff development, whatever it might be just to, 
when I do go out there, you know, live and been out there this year because of COVID, obviously, but last year, you know, you sit on the meetings and if you have anything to add, you add it. I started my junior career uh, in the SJHL and, and I know that you did as well. And, you know, one year with the Melville Millionaires uh, got your junior career started, but I got to ask about the game that has all sorts of for- folklore behind it. Uh, 105 shots against 84 saves and a 21, two loss to Prince Albert. What to take us through that night? What led to you being in net for all, all of that action? Was it was it twenty one to two or twenty one to three? I thought it was three. Oh, it might be three. I'm just going based off Wikipedia here. <laughs> twenty one to three, but who knows? That's a long time ago. You know what? That was uh, I was I was sixteen years old. It was um, first of all for myself for development. It was a terrific year because we weren't very good. So we were, we were the worst team in the league by quite a margin. And you, you, you pretty much got, you saw a lot of rubber every night. So if you're a goalie, as much as hard as it is, you're losing a lot of games and it's not a lot of fun. Um, the development part of it was really good for me. A game you're referring to, it was in, yeah, it was in PA. Um, I think they had Dave Tippett and uh, James Patrick and Bobby Lowe's. I mean, it was, it, it was a good team. It was a top team. And second last game of the year, and we had guys, I don't know how many skaters we had, but we probably had a dozen skaters at, at most. Um, and if I remember correctly, 30-some shots a period, but the first period I let in three, second period I let in six, and the third period I let in 12. By the third period, I was 170 pounds probably. I, I could hardly get up off the ice when I went down. So, But it was quite the adventure, not one of my, my prouder moments, but I think I was the star of the game, so. <laughs> well, the exact quote in the newspaper after, according to the Regina Leader Post, uh, a couple of members of the Raiders said that if it wasn't for you, they would have scored 34 or 35. <laughs> so obviously that was uh, quite the night. Is that something that you get, you know, you know, get asked about a little bit from some of those other guys in PA that, you know, maybe cross paths with you in the NHL? I, uh, Tip has never said a word to me about it. He probably had about six that night, but he hasn't said a word to me about it. So <laughs> I, I do get asked about it in interviews. Um Quite often, I mean, it's something, not something that happens very often, but uh, unfortunately, I was on the, the wrong end of that one. So now that we're going back and talking about your early junior days here, Ron, you would go from your one year with Melville into the Brandon Wee Kings, where you end up playing eventually three seasons. Uh, turns out to be, we're going to just use the word legendary seasons. I mean, you know, we're, we're going to talk later about you being named to the all-time team and just what those years meant. But let's go back to the start. And what do you first remember... Um, you know, obviously being born here in Brandon, but your first experience coming into the Wee Kings. Well, I, me- I remember I was at camp. I think I was, um, I think I was 14 years old. And of course the hometown boy, I got interviewed. So I got asked about six questions and I think I said yes and no to every question. So that was my first recollection of, of being at some, least in week. Some week things King never camp. change. Some things never change. Some <laughs> prospects <laughs> still very similar. I thought I did. I thought I did such a good job too. <laughs> but you know, then then you know you, you come in and and when I played the year in Melville that next year, I, I felt like I was ready for the for the Western League. Um, and f- for me, as a hometown kid, to play for the Wee Kings was, I mean, it, it, it wasn't quite the NHL, but it wasn't far from it. When you're, a, you know, a, a young kid watching the Wee Kings play, and I actually saw programs at the Wee King games, so I watched all those those big teams at Legos and Boschmans and Allisons and Props and Hamlins and and McCrimmons. So I watched all those teams, and so for me to be able to put that jersey on was absolutely extra special. And um, the three years that there for me was was some of the better better times in my life for sure. Now, Chris, you had mentioned the, the penalty minutes. I'll, I'll let you ask this question of the transition from your first year to your second year, Chris. Well, I was just, you know, we we're, were talking before, Ron, just about, you know, general areas we might want to talk about. And I just off the cuff said, I love looking at stat lines because you can really tell a lot about, you know, how, how a player develops. But there's one that really stuck out for me. And it's the fact that uh, your first year with the Wee Kings, you had zero penalty minutes. Year two, it went up to 66. By year three, it was 117 It's listed here. And then, of course, you have some like 100 uh, plus in the NHL for a couple years. What happened in that first year that set you off for the following <laughs> years that you said, I've had enough. I'm not letting guys come in my crease anymore. 
I, di- I didn't have any penalty minutes my first year. That's not what, on record. Not on record. Not on record. Not at least not what I'm looking at here, according to uh, Hockey DB. I'm going to guess that it had to be a misprint. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, there we <laughs> go. <laughs> I think I probably had a lot of pims as a midget and everything else. So I, I, I'm going to guess that was a misprint. So I don't think anything really changed, it to be honest. To have been. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> We both thought it was an odd number to see yeah. a zero next I've to like, your name. I, I would never. That's why I had to bring it up. I never would have. I guess I thought something legitimately maybe happened, and you were this nice, gentle kid who never let anybody bother him. <laughs> you stuck to your crease, and all of a sudden you be, Jesus. you know, it just come kind of came out of your the shell. Only, but no, the only person that ever thought that was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, your time in Brandon, you know, you had some some great teammates and some great players. And I mean, the record a couple of years, you know, wasn't great. But, you know, thinking back to your time in Brandon, you know, what what sort of memories, you know, come flooding back from those early days? Well, again, I, those were three of the, the best years of my life. I mean, some of the the friends, I mean, I, I grew up with Camp Lant. Um, we played hockey from the time, I think when I got back from the States, going down with my dad, when he played, I was 12 was my first year and Cam and I played it together from there on up. Um, and you know, some of the other people that I met, um, with the week Kings, I mean, the Kelly glow uh, uh, Bruce Thompson's. I mean, it was, we, we had, we had really good teams. I mean, Ray Ferraro, who I'm friends with today. Um, we had really good teams. We didn't, you know, going small little run there my my last year, but we weren't quite elite. Um, but we had some good teams and we had a good time. And uh, junior hockey to me was was an absolute blast. You you love the game. You're you got teammates, and you know there's no money involved. It's just you're playing because you love the game. Um, and the game the game was different back then. Obviously, it was physical and scary at times. You know, we played Regina. Regina was. I, 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 they had toughness in Saskatoon. I mean, Saskatoon had Daryl Stanley, Dave Brown. Uh, who was the other guy? They had one more top tough guy. And it was like, holy smokes, you're going to Saskatoon there. And like, whew, hope we get out of here with a window. Hope we get, get out of here alive as well. So it was, uh, it was a blast. A lot of battles. You know, I remember the Regina, the Regina battles very well. And, uh, it was a, a huge part of my, um, tutelage to, to make it to the NHL for sure as well. What are some of the things that you remember in there with Regina battles? Um, I remember the one game, Dunk McCollum was coaching and it was in the second period. So I was at the far end and, uh, and their coach was, uh, I think it was Bill LaForge at the time. So you guys may or may not know the name, but do a little research if you don't. So all of a sudden I'm in my net at the far end and not five, but six of their players started to come at me. And I'm kind of looking like, what is going on here? The, the puck was at the center ice. The refs are out there, and they're, they're all coming at me. I'm like, whoa, I better, I better get in a corner here so they can't get behind me. So they surrounded me, and I'm in the corner. And I literally, I do have my stick up because I'm shaking. I got six guys, like, you know, got me in a corner. And uh, so that was a little scary. The game was a little different back then. And uh, I, I'll never forget it. I went into the locker room at the end of the period. And Dunk McCollum comes over to me and he goes, great job there. And I, I wasn't happy because I kind of got left down there by myself. And he said, I didn't want to send the boys out because we would have got killed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's one of my fond memories of Regina. We had a couple of bench clears there too, which were, the wild, the wild so were, were you the type of goaltender? I know you obviously you had a bit of a short fuse for lack of a better term, but when those brawls started, were you the type that kind of rolled your eyes and went, Oh no, here we go again. Or were you just ready for those to take off? Well, I don't, I don't know if you're ready for them. I mean, I don't know if there's one guy when you, you got bench clearing brawl, it's not a little nervous. Um, but when they happen, man, you just reacted and you had, you, you had your job to do like 20 on 20, you, you got to have a guy because if, if, if you get beat up and you're laying on the ice guys, all of a sudden in that day, they would go around helping their buddies out. But all of a sudden now you're two on one and one of your teammates is at risk. So it was, uh, it was scary. And look at those, look at that roster Regina. I mean, it was, it was, 
Mark Crawford and Lyndon Byers and Garth Butcher and on and on and on. It was like, whoa, tough, tough teams. So to define it as the Wild West, I mean, were you in that era where in those three years, did you guys have to warm up separately or did that come after that? I think, I think it might have been the year that the year after me or shortly, shortly then, but we, did, we didn't have to. But of course, back then, so you're out in warm ups and each team has however many pucks. You brought your own pucks. So we had with 20 pucks, 25 pucks, whatever it was. If one of your pucks went in the other end, you had to go get it. <laughs> so, because that's your puck. So, one of our guys would go down, and of course, same thing that happened with their team. And as soon as a guy goes in to get it, the other team starts shooting pucks at him, and that's how some of that nonsense started. It was like, and then they finally changed it where if a puck goes in the other end, it stays in the other end. <laughs> <laughs> probably a wise decision. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably makes sense now that you look back at it. <laughs> so you go from playing with the Wee Kings and then how do you make your transition run? What do you remember about turning into pro? You know, it's, it's funny. I remember uh, I was 20 years old and I practiced with the Wee Kings heading leading up to pro camp. So, and I remember I was standing on the, uh, right outside the office there on the ramp, the bus was there. And the bus drove away. It was the last day they were they were they were going to Regina or somewhere for a game. And I was standing there saying goodbye to the boys. I was going to camp, I think, the next day. And it was my 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 heart. I wanted to be on that bus. It was like that's that's my team there. Like I I want to I want to go with them. And then uh, so that was that was actually emotional and a tough moment for me. And then the next day I went to um, down to Philly for for camp. Um, I was there for maybe 10 days. And then my first year was, it was a tough year. Philly shared a farm team with Boston. So there was only one goalie and there was myself and Darren Jensen was, I think a 25 year old. So I ended up going to the international league, um, probably for a month and a half. And then I got called up to Hershey for two months. I got called up to Philly for uh, probably three weeks. I ended up moving eight times that year. So it was kind of a, it was a tough year in terms of, you know, where, where, where's home. And I was in a hotel probably four, four and a half months out of six. Um, so it was a year that one of those years where things went okay, um, on the ice, but off the ice, it was, it was tough. Um, but that's what, that's what, that's what makes you what you are, right? You got to go through, some times that aren't perfect um, to appreciate when you get on the other side of the mountain and, and play in the NHL. So then my second year, I played in American League the whole year. And then the third year I went up, I went up to the NHL. Well, and then, and then, and then when you do that, you're doing that after, you know, playing, like we said, for your hometown team. So that was kind of really, I mean, besides your time in Melville, was that your first time living away from Brandon? Yeah. Yeah. And, and Melville, you know, you, you live a bill. It's, it's, it's a little bit easier that, you know, Joan Chauffeur and Harvey Chauffeur, they cook meals and kind of almost like a, a, a partial mom and dad for you. Melville, you, you turn pro and all of a sudden you're on your own. You're, you're cooking. I live by myself. Uh, three of my teammates lived in the same complex, but we live by ourselves and you know, you're cooking on your own and you're living on your own. It's definitely, definitely a growing experience. And it's really probably, when when you start to grow up obviously we can talk about goaltending development and how it's changed and and you know nowadays to to back then but all of a sudden you know after just a couple of years uh, in, in the minors you jump right into it and have you know an unbelievable rookie year that year and a long playoff run you know the con Smythe trophy you know the Vesna, everything that comes along with the all rookie team and the all-star and whatever else i mean can you believe it looking back at it that that's how your career started in the NHL because it doesn't ever really seem to happen like that for goalies yeah it was it was kind of a magical year uh for sure I mean first of all I went with a really good team um and and secondly Mike Keenan had a lot of belief in me I remember when I went to camp I think I played four preseason games which was a lot um so I I knew I was going to get a, a good shot and then um Bob Froze was there. Chico Rush was there. So we had three goalies. He kept us all. And then um, Bob Froze was runner up for the Vesna Trophy. And Mike had the courage to start me in the first game against Edmonton at home in Philadelphia. And it was, you know, it was a little bit awkward. I mean, I'm playing ahead of Bob Froze. 
who had just been runner up for the Vesna. So, um, but again, I uh, credit to Mike for having the courage to start me. And then they traded for Ozzy about a month or so later and Chico and I finished the year, but that was, that was a magical year. I mean, anytime you, you go to the finals, um, it, it's obviously a great year. We certainly didn't accomplish uh, the one thing we wanted to in the end, but it was a magical year. And when I think back to those teammates, it was, uh, it was special. There was a absolute ton of commitment there. We had so many guys hurt in the, in the finals. We had Davey Poole and had broken ribs and how he was beat up. I mean, we, half our team, Timmy Kerr was out. He didn't play at all. So it was, uh, it was a band-aid bunch, but uh, we laid everything out there right until the final game. And out of all the NHL teams for you to go to with your style of play, I'm sure you kind of fit right in right off the bat with Philly as well. Yeah, that was, uh, I hated them. I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 18 years old. I was actually working at Binkley Motors there. Um, and I got a call. I think the boss comes out and says, you got, you got a phone call. So I, I went and took it with my mother. She said, you just got drafted by Philadelphia. I'm like, Philadelphia, like, whoa. And, you know, I, again, I, I didn't like them. My dad played against them and they beat, beat his teams up and everything else. And it was, they just, I didn't like them. So kind of let it sink in for a few minutes. And then you're kind of like, geez. And I didn't really realize at the time that I didn't like them, but I respected them because, you know, they did everything they could to win everything, whatever, I got to beat you up. We got to outskill you, whatever we got to do, we're going to do it. So I was like, I didn't really realize at the time I, I admired them. So, and then I felt like 15 minutes later, I'm like, you know what, this is kind of a match made in heaven here. So pretty neat the way it uh, turned out. Did you ever along the way have a coach or, or an executive try and pull the reins in on you a little bit, or did you always have, you know, the, the full blessing to be the fiery personality that you are? No, I usually had the, f- the full blessing. One of, one of my coaches along the way told me that I need to stop moving the puck or I wouldn't play in the NHL. So that was the one little bit of pushback. But in terms of my personality and the way I played, I never really, um, you know, if I if I took an unnecessary penalty, a coach might say something just like anybody right. else. Me. But I, nobody ever tried to kind of take my fire away and, and change me. You know, when we are normally in a normal season having weekend games, it's always fun looking and seeing all the different fans and what jerseys or T-shirts they're wearing. And a lot of them will wear different NHL alumni for various players. And one that has been very popular over the years is the Philadelphia Flyer logo. Uh, you just speak about the what seems to be the long line of success that has been Wheat Kings who have moved on into Philly. Yeah, yeah, there, there's there's quite the list there. I mean, obviously, you think of, think of the guys in that team I talked about earlier, right? McCrimmon was there, and Proppy was there, and Ray Allison was there, and obviously myself. So, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, now Ivan and, 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 and Nolan, um, I'm, sh- I'm sure it's just coincidence. I mean, I certainly didn't draft... I even Provorov or Nolan Patrick because they're a weekend. I draft them because we felt like they're the best players available at the time. Um, you know, it's uh, there's there's you know, scouting is a lot different than it used to be. Like some teams used to prefer the Western League or the Ontario League, and the way it is nowadays, you you got to look all over the world. But if the best player option to be with the Brandon Weekings, then then you pick them, and that's certainly what happened with the last two guys that I mentioned. How much of that obviously falls on uh, more more the modern day guys, but how much of that falls on on what Kelly McCrimmon built? Now, obviously, he sold the team and he's focusing now on Vegas. But you know, as an executive in the NHL, when you're looking at junior programs and the success of bodies that they're you know churning out into the NHL, they've got to be you know up there in the discussion. Yeah, for for sure. And you know, there is some of that. There's I certainly won't mention a team, but there's a team where you're typically afraid to afraid to drop because it's the opposite. They don't typically turn out NHL players. Right. So yeah, you look at Brandon, the history is good. And and when Kelly was there, obviously it's a very well run organization. There was structure in it and, and the players, uh, you know, they seem to, to, to turn out to the best of their ability. So certainly it's one of the things you, you uh, take into consideration. 
you know, we were just speaking about a couple of players that you mentioned you were directly involved with drafting. Um, you know, both had great uh, weekend careers. The one, though, has been since my time here, my absolute favorite player to watch, and that's Ivan Provorov. Uh, one of the, like, you could just tell from if you were sitting 400 yards away who he is just by the way he's holding his stick and by the way he's 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 striding around the ice. Uh, can you just speak about about Provi in particular, Ron, about um, what you saw in him? Yeah, he's. Uh, I, I remember the first time I saw him play was in uh, in Toronto, in the big rink there at the. Uh, I think it was an exhibition game for the World Juniors. That was the first time I saw him play, and after the first period, I was like, "Oh my god!" And he didn't. He played three or four or five minutes, maybe. Um, didn't do anything special, but just the way his positioning, his stick position, his hockey sense, everything, I was like, whoa, this kid's good. I didn't know anything, anything more about him. I mean, his dedication, all that kind of stuff. Like his his work ethic, his dedication is, as you probably know, off the charts. He's, he's as dedicated as any hockey player I've ever seen in terms of his workouts, his commitment. He just loves to play the game. Um, if you could play a game every night, he'd probably be happy. So he's, uh, he's a terrific young player and he's going to get better. And, uh, he's, uh, one of the smarter players I've ever, I've ever been, been associated with for sure. Obviously, uh, you know, the latest kind of brand and connection is, is with Mark Gregg. Of course, he's up uh, in executive, you know, scouting with the Flyers. And there's a great picture of young Ridley Gregg on the stage kind of as, I think, as the runner. Uh, I don't know what year that was, but he's just a young little guy. Um, you know, talk about, you know, Mark Gregg and, and you know, what he's done uh, on a scouting side. And then what you've heard about Ridley, of course, taken by Ottawa. But it's kind of got to be cool to see guys that you've worked with along the way or played with to have kids have success. Well, it is, but it also makes you feel pretty old, right? I, I look at Gregor as a young guy and then I see Ridley. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> actually, um, Ridley was down. It was his his draft year, the Bantam draft. And I think it was about a week later, he was, he was, it was a draft. And I, I met him, Greg was there. I met Ridley and I said, uh, I said to Ridley, I said, well, I said, you're going to really enjoy playing for the Brandon Weekings. And he looked at me like, like, and again, this is a week before the draft. I was kidding. And he had no idea why I would say that or anything else. Right. But and Greg was like, well, whatever, whatever. But it was, it was actually pretty funny. A week later he goes to the Weekings, and I was like, <laughs> I sent Gregor a text. I said, he's Gregor. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to be right, but I guess I was. So <laughs> I, I actually, I've seen Ridley play a couple of times. He's, he's got a lot of spunk. He's uh, play certainly plays a different game than, than his dad. His dad was a very good player, high skill, you know, could score, could make plays. Uh, Ridley's got a little more feastiness and um, a bit of agitator in him, which is, which is a nice quality to have. You were part of one of the, one of the years in Quebec that you know, was one of the weird years. So, so let's talk about the trade from Philadelphia to Quebec. How did you find out about that? And, and were you happy to go to Quebec? I mean, it was, you know, a one year stop for you. Let's, let's head down that road into Eastern Canada. Yeah, that was uh no, I was not happy. That was that whole Eric Lindros. Uh, right. Uh, debacle. He got traded twice. So there was, you know, the arbitrator was in charge of it. And I don't remember the day, but I do remember that the 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 uh, the ruling was going to come out at noon. So I remember where I was. I was at home. Um, of course, we had the landlines then. So my phone rang at twelve o'clock. I'm like, "Oh boy, this is not good news." So sure enough, I answered the phone and Russ Farwell and said he got traded to to Quebec. And I I mean, quite honestly, I was crushed. It was it was my first trade. I got drafted by the Flyers and. Um, it, it was, it, that, that was, it was tough to deal with for me. I mean, to be honest, um, once I got to Quebec, great city, um, very welcoming, you know, good organization at the time and, and a really good young group of hockey players, you know, Sackett, Sundin, Lecision, um, just a Stefan Fassett. It was just, um, Owen Nolan, uh, really Curtis decision. So sort of like you looked around and you kind of went like, Whoa, this is, this is, this is going to be something special here. And I think we lost out in the first round that year, but they, you know, obviously moved to, to Colorado and Forsberg come in a, a year or so later. And, uh, 
and they won, but it was they, you knew they had something special uh, building at that time. The, the people in Quebec were terrific, great fans, loud, um, loved their hockey, passionate. Um, and it was, it was a fun year. We had uh, two of our kids were, were with us I'm trying to think how old. Actually, we had a baby. Becca was a baby. So we had three kids and um, we had a hill up the road. I used to take the kids to bargaining. Um, at, and we, we actually had a great time. My wife learned. She knew a little bit of French going in, so she learned the language. And it was a really good experience for us as a family, for sure. So um, from there, you, you end up in a roundabout way, eventually getting back to the Flyers. What was that like getting back to the team after, you know, you played there, you had so much emotional connection, I'm sure. You leave, you go to Quebec, you go through the New York Islanders, then you're back at Philly after just two years away. Yeah, it was, uh, I, I was very excited. It was, um, felt like I was going home. Yeah. Uh, Bob Clark went back to Philly as a GM, he was out for a couple of years. He went back, he acquired me back. Um, and it was, it was, it was a dream come true to, to go back there and finish my, my career where I started was, was a lot of fun. We had, we had good teams. Um, so didn't, didn't win the big one, but we, you know, went to the finals and uh, had a lot of fun and had a, had a really good team. I and mean, we were a contender for my last four or five years, which is pretty much all you can ask for. Was there ever a chance that you could have uh, got closer to home and played for the Winnipeg Jets at some point in your career? Yeah, I don't. I mean, you don't really, you don't really control that yourself, right? There was rumors um, about me getting traded there when I was, I was pretty young, like maybe a couple of years in. And I remember Bob Clark coming. He, he poo pooed the rumors, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I, I love the Jets franchise and everything else, but when you're, on one team, you're not really thinking about going to another team. So, um, you know, my desire was to, to stay in Philadelphia my whole career, even when it started. But um, that's that's not under your watch. So you just roll with the punches. Uh, that's uh, that's kind of an iron- ironic thing for Ron Hextall to say, roll with the punches. I like that. Uh, <laughs> one of the other things that you are uh, notorious for was – taking chances at empty nets and and firing that puck 200 feet down the ice and, and you managed to score a couple of times. Was that something that you always tried and, and messed around with in practice? Or was this something just out of the whim, you just had a chance and, and fired away? You know what? Um, it wasn't really up in my list of priorities where I, I want to score a goal. I mean, I knew, I, I mean, I knew I was capable and I knew it could happen, but it wasn't like I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to score a goal. Um, but in Philly, my, like my teammates started getting on me, you know, heck you got, you got to try and score. And then whenever the net was empty, the fans would start kind of getting anxious and start chanting shoot. And um, so I never, I never wanted to put my team in a bad position, but if you watch me play, like I would, I would shoot the puck out of our zone a lot on the, the penalty kill. So if you're going to shoot the puck out of the, on the penalty kill, you might as well hit the net, right? So when the opportunity came, we had a two goal lead against Boston and the opportunity was there. So I took it and I just happened to hit the net. So again, it was not something that I, that I planned or had high up in my priority list, but I will say as soon as I scored our whole bench, they, they came out and surrounded me. It's almost like we won a playoff series or hooting and hollering. And I'm like, I, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Um, but the organization got us a nice plaque and uh, the, of the game sheet, and it ends up being a being a nice thing. But but the reaction of my teammates really made it special for me. Did you keep the puck and stick, or did those end up like at the Hockey Hall of Fame or anything along those lines, or did you have those up in your house? <laughs> yeah, I, I still have them. They're not they're not up, but I I have them. <laughs> so was like so that was the, the time that happened in pro but do you remember at all times the trying that during your minor hockey days like when did you first have the confidence as a goalie to be like i can do that i can hit that net from my net well in 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 minor hockey even in junior your sticks aren't aren't like you know my sticks and brandon there the first couple of years were pretty pretty thick like you couldn't you couldn't shoot like like you could if you had a stick that was um more you know custom made and curve and my third year in brand that i actually got a um 
I got a pattern made. And that was that was when I think my puck handling probably went to another level it was my third year when I was 19 um, and then carried on through the pros. Once you get everything's custom made, your gloves are custom made, you can get them made however you want. And that's that's probably when it took off. But I think I developed it. I developed it all through my childhood. Like I did, I did move the puck, um, but I don't think I got to a level of scoring probably until my last year of junior. I was probably capable of it. You touched on the sticks, and that's one thing I, I, you know, I was a goalie growing up, and you know, I loved watching it and, and watching the development of of goaltender equipment transition from you know the '90s into the 2000s, and then to today. You know, we look back at pictures of you playing in Brandon. You got the heavy pads and the tiny yeah. little helmet and tiny chest protector. You know, over the course of your career, that had to be a significant change for you year in and year out, the technology getting better and better. And it probably resulted in less ice packs after each game, would it not? Yes. Oh, 100%. I, I even remember being like 14 years old and my, my, like my arm pads, they, they didn't have any hard plastic on them. So it was all kind of felt. So every time you literally got hit with a shot, it hurt and you get, you get hit in the elbow bone and the, sh- the shoulder and the clavicle and it's, Oh, it was painful. And then you get to junior and the, it, it's, it's a little bit better for sure. But then by, by the end of my career, I mean, it was like, you you know, you bring, bring it on, whatever, wherever you guys want to shoot. It was, but yeah, it was, it was a little painful there on the, on the way up and you're right. The pads the pads were, they were deer hair and the deer hair soaked up the water. So by the end of the third period, your pads were like, they were like two, two weights, and, you know, 15, 15 pound weights on your legs. And uh, when I look back at it, I, I, you often wonder why they didn't change the technology sooner. It wasn't like, it wasn't really rocket science, but um, I don't know. And then even my first, I don't know, seven or eight years in the NHL, they would, they would restuff my pads halfway through the year with deer hair. So I'd have twice as much deer hair. And I mean, they felt better because there was a little bit more bulk, but the weight that was being added, it was crazy when you, when you think back to it. So what would you be like now if you could strap on, you know, today's equipment? Uh, would, would you feel like that would have made you a, a better goalie or would you be moving too quick or would it be too big and bulky for you? Well, you, you know, it's, it's funny because we, I don't remember what year it was probably in the mid nineties, and I remember Mike Richter having really wide pads, probably 16 inches. And, and the limit was 12. So <laughs> right. They, they didn't ever, ever measure us. So I'm like, if he's going to cheat, I'm standing at the other end. Like, I'm going to. So I ended up fanning mine out. And then a couple of years later, they cut down on it. So now we had to bring them in a little bit. Now, bring them in. They come in with a with a stick. 12 inches and all they had to do is go down your pads like that it wasn't real complex <laughs> so all you did when they came in is you put your pads on their side and you just pushed them down you could always get them 12 inches because it was it was deer hair and then as soon as they left you just fan them back out step on them and get them back to the to the 14 or 15 inches they were so it was a bit of a game back then um but once the foam came in it got a little more difficult to have them bigger when, when you went down to 12 or 13 inches, you, you could move so much better. I mean, honestly, I think I was a better goalie with the 12, 13 inch pads than I was with the, the 15 inch just because of mobility. I, uh, you know what? I, maybe this is a good time for us to go into the email inbox because I'm noticing that uh, somehow. And Ron, we we could just talk to you about so many different things. It's already been over half an hour though, and we appreciate you taking any time and talking to us. But we also have a number of listener questions that I want to make sure that we get in here before we forget. Uh, first of all, from Trent, he wants to know: after your running with Chelios in the playoffs, did you ever get a chance to sit down with Chris and talk about that moment afterwards? Well, actually. I don't know if it was Hockey Night in Canada or national broadcast, but when I was I was managing the Flyers and we were in Detroit and Detroit old Joe Louis Arena, you, you go up in the, the the press box and our box was here and the Detroit box was just down from ours and they had to go through ours to get in theirs. So I'm standing there before a game and Chelly walks by and we shake hands and we're standing there talking for 10 or 15 minutes. And the national TV camera had us on there. And I I got so much feedback from people. Like, they, they couldn't believe, like, we talk. Like, I mean, 
we're, 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 I don't know, probably 50 year old men or he was probably older than that at the time. And well, what do you think we're going to do? Like duke it out? Like we're not on the ice anymore. It's sort of like, yeah. You know what? Chris Chelios, I've always said, like he would have been a great flyer and I would have, I would have loved to play with him. That's just the way it is. Those guys that you battle with and don't like and go after, you respect them more than, more than anybody. So like I said, he would have, he would have made a flyer for sure. Uh, question here from Delaney. Who is your favorite goalie teammate? You know, there's uh, there's a lot of like bond between goalies. Uh, who is uh, one of your one, one of your favorite guys to to share the crease with? You know what? I, I could I could I could probably mention every guy I played with. You know, it, you know, Facet and Garcno and Chico and but I'll, I'll I'll go with Chico Rash because he was my first year. And I really, I really did need a mentor. I was 22 years old. Everything was new to me. I didn't know the shooters. I didn't, you know, so he, and he, he was, he was, again, I was 22 and he was 38 and I forget what I used to call him grandpa or something, but he, he was almost like a father figure for me. He'd, he'd been around the game. He understood the game. You know, we talk about shooters before the game. So uh, like I said, I couldn't pick one out, but I just mentioned him because he was my first and, and a very good mentor for me my my first year. The Fosters want to know, and uh, we don't want to cause any kind of tampering issues with you working for the Kings, but how about the rumors about uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins and their open general manager? Uh, you know, obviously a big rival of, of your favorite Flyers. I mean, what would that even look like? How would that even imagine a Ron Hextall working for the Penguins? Yeah. I never uh, pictured that. Oh, uh, <laughs> I was kind of hoping that question wasn't going to come up, but I, I did do an interview, um, Zoom interview, and I'll wait to hear back. So we'll wait and wait and see what happens there to make much of a comment. <laughs> I got two uh, here. Chris texted into me. One is not a question; it's a comment from Tyler Plant, Cam's son. He okay. said he told me to say hi to you and remind you that you were uh, his favorite player growing up, but you're also the reason why he got into so many fights playing in the minors because he wanted to be like you. So he kind of blames you for how many times he got beat up in the minors. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 I took that as him blaming me and I, I, I take offense to it because did I, I didn't, I have zero penalty minutes my first year. You guys said <laughs> apparently according to hockey DB. And if it's on the internet, it's true, right? Isn't that how that works? Uh, the the other question I got um, uh, from 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 Cam, he says, uh, Ron, goaltenders can be a bit of a peculiar bunch. Did you have any uh, real superstitions when it came to game day? Is this from Cam? Uh, not from Cam Plot. It's ironically just a different guy named Cam. <laughs> I was I was gonna say you just said Tyler Cam. I'm like he, he, this is a setup here. Well, I was a- I was a goalie, so of course I was I was superstitious. But I, I always say, on game day, I just like to be habitual. I like things to be the same. I I went to the rink at the same time. I ate the same food. I slept the same amount. I went to the game. My routine before the game was the same. So for me, it was more. I'm I'm going to say it was just more habit than superstition. <laughs> Another uh, email here from Chad. He wants to know, and, and talking more about like, with the pandemic going on, though, and all pretty much all of junior hockey losing this season, from an evaluation standpoint, how does that impact how you look at players, how you project them, Ron? And do you think that it might have some value of pushing back the draft because of all this? Yeah, I, I, I think it does. I mean, I think, I think probably the entire season's got to play out, but I, I do think, I mean, how do you evaluate kids that haven't, they haven't played? You, I mean, kids change so much from one year to the next. And a lot of those kids weren't well, probably most of them weren't even watched at all. You might've, you might've seen them, but you weren't focusing on them because they're draft eligible the next year. So I would, I would venture to guess that the league will push the, the draft back um, to be fair to everybody. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult time we're in and no one wants to push the draft back, but I think the most practical thing for everybody is probably pushing it back. And quite honestly, I think it's a fair thing. You got any more emails, Chris? That was it for the email inbox. Because I thought we could uh, we could kind of wind down with uh, some rapid fire stuff. Because I've got some questions too. Because I grew up, and I mean, obviously, being the voice of the Weekings, I got to stick to the script and talk about that. But the, the young goalie in me wants to ask you a couple questions as well. So we'll hit you with a couple rapid fire ones. 
And, right. you know, I want to go back to your playing days uh, in Brandon because just the other day we saw the Stampede Corral in Calgary coming down. Now, Brandon got to play a game in there a couple years ago as part of their historical tour. But back in your junior days, what was your favorite rink to play in in the Western League? Oh, it was probably, probably Regina, just, just because of the battles. It was like, it was, you're going in there and boy, you better be ready to play and you better be ready to defend yourself and your teammates. And so it was, uh, the intensity in Regina, the Agrodome was always high. Um, they had a good team. We had a good team and those were, those were fun games. And my other one, who was the hardest shot you ever faced in your playing career? Uh, and I mean, probably, it doesn't have to be mathematical. Probably, it could just be one that felt the hardest. Probably Al McGinnis. Al McGinnis. Stefan Richet for a forward had a bomb. Uh, guy in practice, John, John Leclerc, used to hit me up here all the time. <laughs> he shot hard. And actually, big Shell Samuelson had a, he had a real heavy shot. If it hit you, it was just like, I mean, he had no touch. The touch of a blacksmith. He couldn't score a goal. But when it hit you, it was just thump. So... Those are kind of the guys, but Al McKinnis was, he was the guy. Who is the player that you grew up idolizing that you most wanted to be like? Uh, My dad played with Jimmy Rutherford uh, in Pittsburgh there. So I was in Pitt for, I don't know, five or six years when I was really young and Jimmy made a big impression on me. He, uh, he ended up giving me a mask of his. Um, I got a pair of his skates, but they were, they were a little bit too big. uh, So I didn't wear them much. Um, And Jimmy, Jimmy came out and played road hockey with us a couple of times and he, he was just really good to me when I was a kid. So Jimmy was the guy. I mean, there were other guys along the way, uh, but Jimmy was the number one. When you go back to your playing days, uh, was there a guy, obviously the Wayne Gretzky's and the Yarmir Yagers, but was there a guy that you just couldn't stop? He just had your number. And even to this day, it frustrates you thinking of him coming down on you. I think, I think that guy, I, I thought you were going to ask who the toughest guy to face. I would have said Mario. Um, one on one, but, but um, Randy Cunningworth, he, he used to score me. It seemed like every darn game, and he, he wasn't. He was, a good, he was a good player, but he wasn't, you know, a gifted scorer or anything. But somehow he'd score a goal on me every every game, and it used to frustrate the heck out of me. So, so Mario would be the the like you think the most talented player you've ever seen play the game. Yes. Yes. Where would he- off the off the charts. Off the is charts. Is it even fair to compare a guy like Mario or Wayne to a guy like Connor McDavid, or is it just so different now? It, it, it's 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 different. I mean the um, yeah, it, it's it's different. And and like Mario and Wayne, they weren't really a speed game. They were they were a thinking game. I mean Mario had underrated speed, um, but they. They saw the ice so well, and you know a lot of McDavid's game, which the way it is today, is is based on speed. So it's hard to compare the two, and even numbers you can't you can't take numbers from the '80s and '90s and compare them to today. It's it's harder to score today. Um, and I mean McDavid, obviously, he's a he's a terrific player. My last rapid fire one: uh, if you had to grab one piece of memorabilia from your playing days. Uh, to take with you um, and, and bring on display and show everyone off, wh- what would it be? It would it would probably be my first mask. I mean, I I like masks. Masks are kind of my they're kind of my thing. I think I've always uh, I've always been really um, intrigued by masks. And like I said, I got Jimmy's. You know, it's a it, it's a little red one. It's just flat. It's got eye holes this big, and it's it's one of my my uh, most prized possessions. I, one of my last ones would be uh, when you were growing up watching the Weekings, who was one of your favorite players? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, Glenny Hanlon was there. So I, I, I like Glenn Hanlon kind of, um, but that whole team, like you think back to those teams, I mean, they were, they were so good. I mean, Durlego was top player. Boschman was a top player. Brian Prop, who I ended up playing with for a number of years, was a top player. Ray Allison, Brad McCrimmon, Mike Perovich. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I, I don't know that I had a, a, a favorite player, but I, I do know this. I mean, I was a young kid at the time. I don't know what I was, 13 or whatever. And 
and I knew how good that team was. Like I didn't know that much about hockey, but you, you would, you, if you were in the building, you knew how good that team was. I mean, it was, it was 10 to one every night and the odd game, like when maybe we knew West would come in and you knew it was going to be a close game and it'd be like, Whoa, like they only won four to two or something like that was, it was an absolutely incredible team. And like I said, even at my young age, you knew, you knew how good that team was. Well, and it's almost have- crazy. Uh, sorry, I was going to say how much more special it was that when the Wee Kings, when all the votes came down and the all-time team was named, that the top forwards are the three guys that you would have been watching there. The defense would have been uh, Brad, who you also would have watched there, Ivan, who you drafted, and then it was you and Nett. So some like incredible uh, Hextall connections there on that top line on the Wee King all-time team. Just kind of quickly, I know it's a couple of years ago now, but I mean, what was that like to you know find out that, that you were named the top goalie in franchise history? That, that was an honor. I mean, I, I take I take a lot of uh, pride in in being a Wee King, and I take a lot of heat for it. you know you, when you go out in the scouting circles and they're like you know you draft Nolan and and, and you draft Ivan. Oh, I guess you're drafting a Wee King again. I took a lot of heat over it. You know, all, 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 up as a weed king and you're a weedy and all that stuff. But I, I take a lot of pride in, in being a weed king and certainly to be, to be named to that team was, was uh, very special for me. I love it. My wife sets off the smoke alarm. Chris's dog's barking in the background. I think that's time. I think it's about time for us to wrap up, Ron. Everything is going to hell in a hand basket here. (laughs) Thank you so much, Ron, for taking time out of your day and uh, talking to us here. We really do appreciate it. All right. It's been a, been a pleasure. Again, our thanks to Ron Hextall for taking the time to, to talk to us there on Super Bowl Sunday while the game was going on. Uh, you know, once that was all said and, uh, and, and done and, and I looked over, I couldn't believe what the score was, what would have happened to be missing Crow. But Tom Brady, wow, the Buccaneers. Oh. Did, did, did you end up watching it after? I did. And you know what? Uh, growing up as a, as a kid, um, you know, I was a big Madden football fan on the PlayStation. And... You know, I always I always kind of picked my favorite teams based on the logo, and I loved the Buccaneers logo as a kid, and I always played with them on Madden. You know, they had Warren Sapp, who was unbelievable, and, you know, they were just a really good team. Of course, they won the Super Bowl in the early 2000s. I think it was 2001, maybe. Um, but I, I, I'm obviously a Viking fan growing up in Manitoba uh, now, but, you know, I, I really didn't have a dog in the fight. You know, I, I like Tom Brady. I've read his books. I think his lifestyle is, is super neat, and what he's done is incredible. But I also like Kansas City. I, I like Travis Kelsey. I like Patrick Mahomes. I love the city of Kansas City. Uh, it's one of my favorite places I've ever traveled to. So I was just hoping for a good game. We didn't really see much of a game, to be honest with you. But Tom Brady, is there anybody better? I mean, you can't argue at any point right now that he's not the best football player of all time. I don't care what anybody says. All Whether I, you like him or not, he's the best. All I know is you never bet against Tom Brady winning the Super Bowl. When it no. gets when I guess that stage, underdog or not, I didn't. I put ten bucks on him. I walked away winning twenty five. So it was it was a good Super Bowl for me. And I'm not even, I'm not even a Tom Brady fan. I actually I cheer for him be, because of my friends. Who, the um, the the amount of hatred, the hatred and and the very strong dislike that they have for Tom Brady for just being a winner. It makes me cheer for him in like almost oh, yeah. a sarcastic way. Like <laughs> I don't like him either, but I'm cheering for him just to spite them, and I want money off him. So go Tom Brady, go go Bucks, go. Why not? Um, and I hope he can come back and do it again. Like how about yeah. his quote? Hey, we'll be back. I- I'm coming back. Yeah, yeah, you are. I mean, yeah. If if I had a hundred extra dollars laying around right now, and I could put on the box to win the Super Bowl next year, I might just do it because, yeah, that guy is just unreal. So. I mean, it was a fun night. I, I wish the Super Bowl w- would be allowed to show the American commercials. Yeah. Uh, I know as a kid we used to. Well, and it was supposed to, to go to back it, to be that way again. They were going to show the American commercials, yeah. and then now all of a sudden the Canadian broadcasters went and they fought that again, and, and they took it away. I, I don't like that either. I agree. Kind of it's lame one of the best parts. I love the commercials, yeah, especially if my team's not in it. I just like to have a little fun with it. But Everybody nonetheless, is. it was a good sports weekend, and it was good to see some people in the crowd again. And I know a lot of them were healthcare workers that have been vaccinated and stuff, but it was nice to see something that looked normal again. You know, I know there were some cardboard cutouts and everything else, but um, it looked cool, and, uh, and it was nice to see. So now we turn our attention to the Western Hockey League and Major League Baseball getting fired up, and, of course, the NHL. They're right in the thick of it, too. So it's a good time to be a sports fan right now, and NASCAR's coming back right away. I'm a closet NASCAR fan, so 
It I is. mean, things are starting to get moving again. So want to want to give uh, a shout out to Nolan Ritchie, who last week filled in for uh, for for Jake Chase on, and actually played on back to back nights. Uh, switching the gears, talking for a moment about esports. So our uh, my IT source. NHL 21 tournament. It is quickly coming uh, to a close as it actually wraps up this weekend. So on Friday night, it's going to be uh, the uh, the 17 plus semifinals, and then Saturday night is all the finals. So as of last week, I mean, there's been happening kind of throughout, but uh, last week there were some more winners uh, who were out of the tournament who then were going and playing. Um, uh, Brandon Weekings as part of the prizing. So on one night, it was Nolan Ritchie, and he played a couple of fans and some back-to-back games. The next night, it was going to be Jake. Well, Jake, lo and behold, he uh, Jake Chason goes to uh, show up to play. It's on his brother's PS4. His brother sold the PS4 the day before and didn't tell him. <laughs> 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 he, and it wasn't all hooked up and, and set up yet on the new one that he had, so... Uh, he's like, oh, what am I going to do? So Nolan pinched in and actually played on back-to-back nights. So shout out to Nolan Ritchie. Uh, we got some more player games coming up, so some more fun on the on the Twitch channel. Uh, but uh, the the big tournament finals, like I said, are coming up this Saturday. So if you want to check it out, it's twitch.tv slash BDN Week Kings. Uh, more info, too, online at weekkings.com slash esports. But uh, that, that's been actually very entertaining. And some of the matchups, Crow, I know that it's video games, but when we get to this point... Like it was the uh, it was the quarterfinals and four of the games I watched were all one goal games and three of them went to overtime. And it was like you talk about guys who can actually play this game. They were pulling off all those amazing deeks and moves and trying different things. And uh, as like a video game player, uh, I played a couple of them in some exhibition games. I understand why I lost like 12 nothing. <laughs> yeah, the kids these days, uh, they got a lot more time on their hands. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's a great way to keep people engaged. And uh, we've seen other other leagues do it, other teams do it. The SJHL, uh, they're doing a, a full tournament. Um, can you still hear me? Am I breaking up? Am I, yeah. am I, can you still hear me? Yeah. Uh, they're doing a full tournament out there with, like, an all-star team, and they got, like, play-by-play guys and everything. It's pretty cool. So. In the email inbox, I uh, just want to say uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, I, again, yeah, we love the feedback. Love really, it. really do, really do. Um, I have, uh, as of today, uh, I believe, reached out to all of the different people uh, who were our prize winners. Um, I, I, again, I just want to thank everybody for that. But uh, So all of the information is going to be in your email inboxes. Um, coming on up this week, I, I can still do, like, local prizes for, for, for people who can come to the store and, and, and can kind of pick up. Um, if we're going to be starting to do ship prizes, what we can do is we can have one winner a week and then we can enter in all the emails. So we're going to have a discussion, but uh, we're going to figure it out. But I kind of like having the emails, something uh, something motivated to kind of keep it going, keep, uh, keep the questions flowed. Uh, for next podcast, it's going to be with Cameron Hughes, super fan, which we talked about last week. Um, the week after that, have we caught confirmation yet, Crow, about who that's going to be? Not yet. Um, okay. The couple guys that you uh, mentioned to me the other day, of course, uh, options. But we'll go with uh, Cameron Hughes, who <laughs> he may not be a household name, but when you see his face and you hear him, <laughs> you'll know who he is. The guy is just, for lack of a better term, just a complete nut bar. And it's <laughs> he has made a living out of being a sports fan. And if if you can... Uh, if you can get a chance to pick up his new book, um, I, I would do it because this guy is just, he's had a crazy life and uh, I can't wait to hear some of his stories. All right. So those who want to send an email, it is qweeklyharvest at gmail.com. The letter Q, weeklyharvest at gmail.com. Uh, that's where you can get a hold of us with absolutely anything. Uh, Crow, any final uh, words? I, I know it was, a, it was a frigid weekend, like we kind of mentioned, oh. causing more issues than anything. Um, there was no way we were going out. We turned into an arts and crafts day and just did some like, like arts, crafts, movies, video games, and, and, and anything besides spending pretty much more than taking the dog outside just to go into his business. Did you, oh, did you, you brave be, it at all? I, I, let me explain to you the day I had on Saturday. So I worked Friday and Friday was cold. It was, it was cold, but it wasn't unbearable. Uh, and, and when we shut down Friday, you know, we were told, Hey, we're not going to be working this weekend. It's going to be too cold. So I thought, Oh, great. You know, I got a, I got a Saturday. I can sleep in a little bit. 
So I got up and uh, the wife and I went to town and thought, well, let's grab a couple of coffees for, for my in-laws that live on the you know same farm just a little bit over. And so we take some coffees over there and uh, my father-in-law comes in and he's just frozen solid. Well, he's got a water bowl that, that waters the cattle and it's frozen solid. So I go out to help him. We get this thing thought out. But, you know, you're working with water, you're wet, it gets cold in a hurry. You're trying to put nuts on on bolts and with your fingers, you can't use gloves. So it's just cold. So anyway, we get that done and I think, okay, that's done. We warmed up, had a bowl of soup and I came home and I was just pumped to have a little nap. I think a Saturday afternoon nap in the sun. Uh, this is going to be great. So anyway, I had the, uh, I, I walked down to the other end of my house and I go to turn on the tap to wash my hands. My bathroom taps are frozen. And you've had that happen. I, you and I've talked about this. So my taps are frozen. So I thought, okay, I've got a calf heater underneath my house that, you know, in the crawl space there, and I can flick that on and heat her up a little bit and thaw it out. And when I'm down there, I realize that my gray water uh, pump out that pumps out into the trees, all my, you know, dish water, uh, all that extra gray water. Well, it's frozen as well. And this pump has been trying to pump through a frozen pipe and it can't. So it just keeps freezing further down the pipe. So I had to take this whole thing apart, put it in my bathtub in the house, turn the shower on, thaw this whole thing out, put it all back together and put it back outside. It was like a nine hour excursion of being outdoors. My mitts were frozen stiff. I couldn't open my hands anymore to do anything. It was just one of those days where everything that went wrong could have went wrong. So anyway, uh, knock on wood, everything's still flowing. We got water moving <laughs> today, but I have a feeling when you look at the next few days, uh, into the later in this week, man, Thursday night and Friday night, minus 38 without the wind chill. Like so this, this, we're going to have more problems than we are going to have good things happen this week. So stay bundled up everybody. And, uh, good luck. If you're going outside, make sure you're dressed for it. And if you're going to drive somewhere, pack your winter gear and make sure your cell phone's charged up. Yeah. This, this may be, one of the longest stretches that I remember in memory of it being this cold for what they're predicting to be this long. Like uh, uh, over, I've never over seen a, week. a 50. I've never seen a minus 50 anything on a forecast. No. Nope. And I, I've literally really? worked in radio. I mean, I don't remember it, and I feel like I would. But I feel like I've worked in radio since 2010 when I started at CQLQ. That's 10 years, 11 years now. And I don't remember ever reading a weather report that had a five in the start. <laughs> Like, that's just awful when you think about that. It was minus 53 this morning at 9 a.m. Yeah. That's just nuts. Uh, it, yeah. I remember reading minus 50s because when it comes to the school division for the staff, their cutoff, it's minus 40 without the wind chill, minus 60 with. So it has really? to be colder than minus 60 for them to actually close down that. Anyway. Some inside info there for you, <laughs> but that's that. That's how I know, and that's like almost apocalyptically cold for them to then say, "Okay, you got to stay home for the day." I don't know. You're right. Oh. I think by the time you hit the five zero, it's just let's let's call it in, folks. Let's all just Shut try down. and stay warm because at that temperature, yeah. you're right. And after a week straight, pipes can only take so much. So oh. you never know well, when they're going to go. And here's the other thing too. Uh, we're going to keep you entertained. Uh, you can go back listen to any of our pods. Uh, you can watch them on YouTube. Uh, you can get them wherever Q country's website, you can pick them up, uh, wherever you get your podcast as well. And you mentioned the announcement that could come this week regarding a potential bubble and return to play. If then, when there's an announcement, uh, you and I will, will come together. We'll do a little emergency pod and we'll get some info out to you guys here, uh, as soon as we can get it out. So you won't have to wait a full week until next Tuesday or whatever to, to find out what's going on. Uh, the second that there's an announcement, we'll try and put something together and do a little emergency pod for you. And uh, all that's made possible by our lovely friends at Coors Light, which at this point, a cold Coors Light, I, I feel like my hands would just freeze to the can at this point. <laughs> I can go Get for one. I can go for Get one of these days. Coors yeah, Light, nice one. the official beer of the brand of Wheat Kings. Please drink responsibly. Uh, thank you, Crow. Thank you, everybody, for listening this week. We will talk to you again uh, be probably before next week. I'm, I'm, I, I got a good feeling. I got, I, I got, I got, I got, I got a pretty good feeling in a couple of days. Uh, we're going to be right back here and talk about another one. However, you're I listening, do- if it's Google, Apple, Spotify, if you're on QCountryFM.ca, uh, however you're listening, appreciate listening, appreciate and subscribing, downloading. What, what are you doing wanna, there on the video side? You're switching I, I, hats. Watching this, I want to be able to take this thing off and not have to wear it anymore. Okay, hold on. This is, hold on. This is the thumbnail. 
This is the thumbnail right here for the for the. Pod I want to be week. able to take this hard hat off and replace it with nothing. Wait, put it back on. Put it put it back on. I want to do that. I want to I want to do the. Yeah, put it back on. I want to be able to take this thing off. I'm tired of working outside. <laughs> okay. There All we right. Go. Goodbye, everybody. Talk to you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Be sure to follow Q Country and the Wheat Kings on Twitter and Facebook for all your Brandon Wheat Kings news. Thanks for listening to the Weekly Harvest. Oh,